week, we talked about Plotinus, and I told you something of the character and disposition of this remarkable man. As I pointed out, although he lived a solitary life and had no family of his own, he was surrounded for the greater part of his life by children and young people. He was the guardian of many distinguished Roman families and through many years served very close uh, to the needs of practical people. At the same time, he was a very deep and mystical person. Perhaps one of the deepest and most profoundly mystical of all the great pagan thinkers. He had greater depth than Marcus Aurelius, a more obvious mysticism than Plato, and a greater strange internal humility than nearly any of the other Neoplatonists. Born in Egypt, he flourished principally in Rome and lived through the greater part of the third century AD. He lived in this critical period when a great world order was gradually vanishing and he united in his own life not only the consolation that wisdom had brought to him but a beautiful and heroic attempt and effort to give this consolation to others and most of his writings are burdened with this gentle acceptance of the human need and as we will try to unfold one of his shortest but best known works this evening I think you will see something of the spirit of the man perhaps we can gather his spirit from his own words better than from the discussion or analysis of his character after all this time. We know that Plotinus was one of the few of these philosophers who frankly and openly admitted that he had passed through certain mystical experiences himself. Uh, the validity of his statements on these subjects is maintained by the quality of his work. There are many statements, even in this little fragment, which could scarcely come from a person who had not personally experienced something of the larger mystery of life. His essay concerning the beautiful perhaps summarizes some of the choicest of his doctrines. It is one of those small gems that sometimes fall from a brilliant pen and are remembered even after greater and deeper works are forgotten. Like Boethius on the Consolation of Philosophy and the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, the essay on the beautiful has become a classic and it is regrettable and that it is not more readily available to students today. We used for our discussion of it the Thomas Taylor translation, which was done in the opening years of the 19th century. The work is scarce, but not rare, and with time and effort can generally be discovered. The essay on the beautiful is best introduced by a study of the Neoplatonic concept of beauty. And in this study, we know that much more is implied and inferred than our common usage. The Neoplatonists in the beginning considered beauty as an alternate, alternative term to be applied with the word good. Good with a capital letter was the Neoplatonic equivalent to our word God and perhaps the word God can be traced to the same derivation, the idea of the good. Certainly we have the term, the good God. 
And this concept of the good presents deity in Neoplatonism as the object of the soul's desire. All things in themselves naturally aspire to the good. And any condition which arises by which this natural aspiration is thwarted, blocked, or retarded, results in an infirmity to the psychic life of the person. The essay on the beautiful, therefore, is very important on a psychological level. It should be given a lot of thought today when we are beginning once more to contemplate the powers resident in the human soul. Good as the object of man's eternal quest is a substance in itself beyond definition. Because we must approach good on several levels. There are things which we commonly and daily regard as good. And these, for the most part, are the gratifications of desires. When things go according to our pleasure, it is good. When they go contrary to our pleasure, it is bad. Then there are other levels of good. There are good laws, which we may grudgingly accept, yet commonly acknowledge. There are good lives relative terms, for that which constitutes goodness of living upon one level may not upon another. There are good books about which there can be no common agreement. Uh, there are good days in which our affairs run smoothly. Then there are good things that can happen to us, for the sick the restoration of health, for the sad the return of joy for the burdened rest and repose. Thus good, in our temporal way of consideration, means an end of a condition which is the opposite of itself. For evil to end is good, for good to end is evil. Thus we measure these things by a relative yardstick. And any improvement in our fortune is a common good as far as we are concerned. Then we have a larger concept of the common good, of working together, of building together, of sharing. We have these good things which come under the heading of virtues. We have moral good, which is virtue. We have spiritual good, uh, which in itself is righteousness or a state of acceptability before God and our own conscience. We have the goods bestowed by knowledge of arts and sciences. Now all these things may confuse us, as Plotinus points out. For is there a good that is apart from goodness and superior to it? Is there a principle or an eternal essence of good and does this operate through things, and is its manifestation the source of goodness? Or is goodness merely a series of accidents, arising in the mixtures and minglings of life? If there is a principle of good, if there is an eternal good, why can one person see good in a thing, and another person cannot see that good? Why does the rain that brings us gratitude cause consternation and distress to those in flooded areas? Our term good, therefore, must be explored more deeply. For we must search for that kind of good which is innate in the body of God. A goodness apart from things. An essential goodness or as Plotinus might have, called, might have called it, an intelligible goodness. The mind, contemplating upon the mysteries of life, is able to create a series of qualities which are mental goodness. Mental goodness may also search from itself 
toward the world around it, seeking for proof and evidence that other things are good. Therefore, the mind may be termed good in itself if it is a well-ordered and useful mind. But it cannot be termed good if it is an ill-ordered and useless mind. Thus again, good seems to be separate from mind even as good is separate from those things that we call good. All good things which exist in this world are subject to alternations. Too much of good becomes itself a serpent, and we are no longer happy. Therefore also can we say that good is associated with anything. So we come to the Neoplatonic speculation is good a relationship of things? Are things in a certain order good, and in another order not good? And can things of themselves not good, by order and arrangement, become good? This is a very important consideration, because if this is true, then all good is a compound. Good is something composed of parts, themselves dissimilar to their totality. This in turn leads to other speculations. And from these thinkings comes the consideration that good is not necessarily a compound. Because a thing in itself good may be composed of other things in themselves also good. And Plotinus gives the example of a great building. And the architect, when the building is finished, looks at the whole structure and he says it is magnificent. It is correct. It is mathematically perfect. It is in law and order. It is a work of great beauty. It is symmetry. It is everything that for a building of that purpose and that kind would be good. So the building is a common good composed of many parts. Yet this same architect, looking at a single column in this building and considering it thoughtfully and observing that its proportions are proper and symmetrical, that it fulfills exactly the purpose for which it was intended, may also rightly say that the single column is good. Therefore, good does not have to be a compound. The parts in themselves can also be good. A greater good may therefore be a combination of parts in themselves good. Therefore good is not necessarily a compound. On the other hand, certain things, apparently worthless in themselves, such as crude and uncut stones, when worked upon and perfected by art and rendered beautiful, may become equivalent to or worthy of the term good. Yet in their rough and unconditioned states, they are not obviously good. Yet the power or possibility of goodness lies in them and is released through the work of the stonecutter. Therefore, the stonecutter bestows good. And good may not necessarily be inherent. And we can continue this discussion for a long time on various levels and in various ways. Always we are seeking to determine the location of good, the fact of it, as divided from all of the secondary considerations. And it is in these thinkings and in this approach to subjects that we observe one of the magnificent facets of the mind of Plotinus. Even his most mystical, his apparently most emotional and fervent thoughts are always approached carefully, cautiously, unfolded in orderly sequence. Each reasonable doubt resolved before the mind passes to a further consideration. Never is a statement made and left unsupported or without the necessary attendant and commentary thinking. Thus we have a mystic who is also a highly ordered thinker. And yet all his thinking is used not to prove the correctness of his mind, but to prove the sublimity of the divine plan. 
And in this we have the use of mind, the use of words. And Plotinus, in one of his uh, discussions, weeps a, a little over the sorrow of words. How little words can tell. How poor they are in the search for terms suitable to clear the doubts and misgivings of the human soul. And yet perhaps there is no one in antiquity who used words more lovingly, uh, more beautifully, and more exactly than this man, who would have been an inspiration <coughs> to the best part of modern semantic thinking. And on, in his essay on the beautiful, therefore, we're just going to read a few of the opening lines to sort of set the pattern for you, and then we will go into the problem that he presents. He begins thus, Beauty, for the most part, consists in objects of sight, but it is also received through the ears by the skillful composition of words and the consonant proportions of sounds. For in every species of harmony, beauty is to be found. And if we rise from the senses into the regions of soul, we shall there perceive studies and offices, actions and habits, sciences and virtues, invested with a much larger portion of beauty. But whether there is above these a still higher beauty will appear as we advance in this investigation. That is his opening statement of the purpose of his work. And from that, we can begin to summarize the thinking of this man on a subject which is very close to us and is probably much closer as we understand what he meant by the beautiful. As a springboard for his discussion, Protanus compares the beautiful and the good because he affirms and assumes that there is a valid relation between these two terms. Valid perhaps first in the fact that neither can be arbitrarily defined. This in itself is important for that which cannot be captured in a net of definition may very likely be superior to definition and therefore belong in a different world a higher sphere of human contemplation. And he further held to be true <coughs> that the principle of beauty, if it has a separate and natural existence, if it is an archetype, if it is an eternal being resident in existence or in space, must be apperceived apart from its productions or those things which we call beautiful. Therefore he recommends us to consider the possibility that things so called beautiful are the long shadow of beauty cast upon matter and that the beauty of physical things lies not in themselves but is bestowed upon them by the operation of a superior power. We may go so far as to see that Plotinus is identifying the term beauty uh, with the Christian concept of grace, because beauty is a power for goodness, a power for healing, a power for health and well-being, eternally and everywhere available and suitable to the perceptive faculties of various orders of living creatures. He then points out that for each species or genera its own kind is beautiful. Therefore that beauty has in its material sense a relation to acceptances, that which is strange, distant, improbable, 
or difficult of comprehension is not immediately recognized as beautiful. In art, this means that the artist, seeking to capture a concept of beauty, will find this concept changing and elusive, and that which satisfied his instincts at one period of life will not satisfy him at another period of life. The objects themselves have not changed. The energy moving through them has not changed. What then has changed? He has changed. And the secret lies in himself. When the conqueror Cambyses is said to have approached the great temple of the Olympian Zeus for the purpose of destroying the building, he entered first into the great structure and there gazed for some time upon the magnificent ivory carving of the face of Zeus, this gigantic structure, this statue, with flesh of ivory and robes of gold, seated upon its Olympian throne. And after he had gazed upon it for some time, Cabeses slowly fell to his knees, and the sword dropped from his hand, and he took an oath that he would not destroy that building or injure the god who sat there. Yet no one had spoken. Only ivory and gold had glittered before his eyes. What then had moved the conqueror? He himself said that he could not withstand the nobility of this splendid face that looked down upon him. And in this then, can we say that the Olympian Zeus was dead? Or that it was merely a form? Can we say that Forms of this kind, statues, paintings, and works of art, have no life in themselves. They have some kind of a radiant power, a symbolic, magical influence. For Cambyses bent to a symbol of incredible nobility, a strange, unearthly regality from the great statue by Phidias looked down, and Cambyses could not withstand this strange expression. The answer somewhere, according to Plotinus, would have rested in the sublimity of the depiction. That this beauty, like a light, shone through, and yet it shone through only the works of man, an inanimate substance that would soon return to the dust. Yet this beauty lived. Is this beauty then captured only in the works of men? No. Plotinus believed that it was captured most in the works of the infinite itself. That no man could equal the sublimity of the sunset or touch the grandeur of the midnight sky spangled with stars. Plotinus felt that men could not see these things, could not look upon them without being influenced in some subtle way, and recognized an incredible beauty flowing in upon them. Yet beauty is not in the stars. Beauty is not in the earth or in the air. Beauty is not even in the fire, that most incorporeal of elements which seems itself both bodied and unembodied. Something that blazes and vanishes again. Yet every motion of it, every flicker of it, has some strange and wonderful fascination for the human mind. So beauty is none of these things. Beauty also is not corporeal. And yet the human being the human body, the human face, the human mind, all these things may be beautiful, but they are not beauty. And yet we may rejoice in the symbols and similitudes of beauty. And Plotinus says, let us behold a handsome man or a beautiful woman, and let us say, why do we say this man is handsome or this woman beautiful? And his answer was, in most probability, we will say so because of the conformity of natural parts. 
we will say that the eyes are properly set, the nose is of due size, the face is well shaped, there is no violent asymmetry of parts or proportions, the whole form and structure corresponds with a norm, with that most stylish, most acceptable, most understandable by us. And when things are in their due proportions, and there is no deformity, no distortion or asymmetry in the compound, then we say that this compound is handsome or beautiful. If, however, there be this proportion, we will not say this. Yet Homer was blind, an aged and crippled man, and those who knew him called him beautiful. And Socrates, probably the homeliest of the Athenians, with his bandy legs, his a short, awkward, heavy body, his bulbous nose, his strange, bulging eyes, declared himself to be so imperfectly formed that dogs, seeing him on the street, howled and fled with their tails between their legs. Yet the disciples of Socrates called him beautiful. Therefore, beauty must have some other existence. And those who are satisfied only with proportions and dimensions and arrangements of outward parts see beauty, accept it, and hasten on their way. Others concern with something else, some other value, may cling for a moment to the outer semblance of beauty, find it empty, and pass on to something else wherein they find a greater beauty. They find the beauty of greatness of character, beauty of nobility of spirit, beauty of gentleness and humility of service. All these things likewise are beautiful. And as has been pointed out, there is also a strange, subtle beauty in a common ruin we will find the broken pillars of an ancient temple or an old arch bind with creepers and artists will come from all over the world to paint the beauty of this wreckage and so even these things can be beautiful because there is a nostalgia in the human soul that rejoices also in that kind of beauty uh, which the uh, Neoplatonists call the beauty of sadness. Things do not always have to be beautiful and happy. Some, some things can be beautiful and sad. And why do these things that are sad seem beautiful to us? Usually because they release something. They cause some mellow reflection in our own lives. They revive old thoughts. They surround us with memories, some pleasant, perhaps some painful, but all rich, like the involved tapestry of some ancient loom. So we find beauty also in these things. And as uh, uh, Plato pointed out, if you find the beauty of infancy, in a bodily proportion which we reject in maturity, and we find the beauty of great age, in those gentle, feeble, and infirm ways which we would reject in manhood. Each thing, in its own season and its own time, is beautiful. And the answer lies in the tree, or in the shrub, or in the vegetable in the garden. The tree that bears leaves is beautiful. The tree that bears fruit is beautiful. And in these different periods, the beauty of the summer foliage, the beauty of the bare lines of the tree in winter against the whiteness of the snow. All these things are beautiful. So beauty is not summer, nor is it winter, nor is it youth, nor is it age. <clears throat> beauty is something else. And so Plotinus naturally proceeds to search more inwardly for beauty. And he comes upon the number of excellent things uh, to bring to attention. Beauty inwardly 
extends from those most simple practices, the beauty of the mother meditating upon her newborn child, the beauty of young lovers, the beauty of strength performing works of virtue, the beauty of the man working in the field. All these things have inspired the poet, the artist, the musician, to great compositions, because each has recognized in some menial and common thing the mysterious shape of a satisfying beauty. So we go on from these to other things, and Protinus takes us into what he calls the beauties of the mind, the beauties of the human thought. And he tells us and explains to us how the extension of the mind in its own inward actions may be beautiful. How the individual in the cultivation of virtue discovers a great beauty. How the artist, the musician, experiences beauty within himself long before he can confer it upon the outward world. He goes on also to explain those graces of the soul, those natural concords, that fellowship, that friendliness, that sharing of common opportunity and responsibility. These two working side by side in the cause of something that is greater than either of them. These things too are strangely, deeply, and movingly beautiful. And he also mentions the beauty of pure knowledge, the beauty of reason, the beauty of that strength of mind which cutting through all sham and fallacy achieves one of the great beauties of the soul, honesty. And therefore, our philosopher gives quite a thought to the, the glory, the beauty, the sublimity of just good old-fashioned honesty. That here is an ornament, here is something that is as wonderful as a sunrise and as glorious as the moon hovering over a wonderful moonlit sea. Honesty then, integrity, stamps a beauty upon the mind. It also radiates from this its own center and is felt benevolently by the whole world or by all who come within the reach of its light and warmth. The beauty of the poet, the great dream of Homer, the wonderful theogenic vision of Hesiod, the magnificent word symbolism of Virgil, all of these things coming out bear witness to some wonderful order and dispensation in the mind. For the mind that can produce beauty must in some strange way be beautiful. Now that leads to other thoughts. Man is a compound creature with many members, dimensions, and parts. In all these he may not be beautiful, but in something he may have an excellence that is significant. Thus men may not in all things be temperate, yet they may achieve some outstanding work. But, as Plotinus points out, not in this essay, but in other works, the achievements of men by the beauty within themselves can be divided into two orders. If beauty arises in a temperament, itself imperfect, then that beauty must move outwardly and produce effects upon the physical world or upon the objective life. Thus a man who is not great in morality may clear the weeds out of a field and restore it for the harvest. A man whose life is intemperate and disordered may, like Richard Wagner, compose great music. Yet all the things which he does belong to the objective world because with without balance of temperament. Man can carve and cut and hew. He can fashion and mold and design according to the laws of the sciences with which he is informed. But these productions, the result of an imperfect knowledge of beauty, have within them the impermanence, which is the mark of this incompleteness 
and as the oriental philosopher might say only when man is perfect can he produce perfect beauty and when he produces this perfect beauty it is immortal and can never perish but everything that is the production of imperfect or immature beauty is fragile and must have an endurance and then must vanish away thus also in the compound of the soul what constitutes then the evidence that beauty can be created by man and what is opposed to this concept man can create the beautiful because within himself resides the imagination the internal visualization necessary for this work but when the individual accomplishes the beautiful is he able to explain his own accomplishment does he know what he has done is he able to distinguish the very fact or principle that transformed the thing he did into beauty he will say yes within a measure this measure of being canonical laws or laws of order the painter knows the principle of dynamic symmetry he knows exactly scientifically where to center his picture he knows that he must not center it in the center if he does it is dead so by degrees he learns also the proportions of the human body the laws of perspective and becomes skillful in the mingling of his colors thus he can explain how he has created beauty or created that which is acceptable and is termed beautiful by those who see it therefore Plotinus might ask did you then fashion this beauty or did all these laws that you kept to make this thing were they the repositories of the beautiful was it the law that ordained the beauty and all you were was a servant of that law keeping it and achieving an end breaking it and destroying that end is then beauty part of law if we keep all laws are we beautiful and if so why are these laws so important and we come to another very interesting point laws in nature particularly laws in the creative arts where beauty has its peculiar throne and where its muses dwell these laws all work from one tremendous principle unity the tremendous impulse of all artistic canon is to bring various elements of composition and technique into oneness they must be brought together and lo and woe the artist whose only unity for his picture is the frame and yet that now is too often the case the laws of order operating in art and music must transform the single notes of a composition into a composition they must also in art transform drawing and color and visualization design all these must lose their own identities in what might be termed the picture no one will buy a picture merely of perspective nor a picture of line or a picture of color although some have been talked into some of these things in these periods of modernity but actually we are buying not the elements of a picture or the separate parts of it we are buying a totality and we are buying a totality that through its unity has become the instrument of a visualization something meaningful in some way has been produced by uniting means and agencies and allowing each to die in a compound that the compound itself might live if the color is too strong then the color has lived at the expense of the line if the foreground is too heavy the background perishes if the lights are too bright the shadows die therefore in all things to maintain balance we cannot have 
the dominance of a single part over totality. All then in these laws of harmonic design, proportion, harmony, rhythm, and motion, all tell us that the purpose by which we achieve our end must be to attain unity, to take fragments and parts and fashion them into a wholeness. Now is this wholeness then, or the unity principle, which considers all things in relations to their parts, is unity the principle of beauty? This would solve the problem of the building of the pillar, architecturally mentioned a moment ago. Because the building is a unity made up of parts, but the pillars each also is a unity, a complete pillar. And if the pillar has a pilaster at the summit of it, this can be separated from the rest and still be a complete unit, because a good pilaster is a unit. It is a thing. It is a totality in itself. And several of these totalities combine to make another. And this, in turn, is blended with many others. Each stone in a building is a unity. And in the old days of the cathedral builders, each was cut lovingly, and with due consideration for great artistry and ingenuity, so that when the stone was finished, the master mason placed his mark upon it, that all the ages might know that he had chewed the stone. He was proud of it. So each stone was a unity, a complete work. This would follow the Pythagorean concept that all things are unities, and that unity, therefore, it can be united with others to form greater unities. In what, therefore, does a unity, being a totality of some kind, differ from what conceivably is not a unity? This brings a pretty, a pretty important problem. Can you think of anything that is not a unity? We can say that bodies are made of cells, and therefore the body is a unity, but each cell is also that every part of nature is therefore a part of infinite unity. This gives us a clue to something, perhaps. Is beauty, then, unity? And is it therefore present in all things, either in larger or smaller units? And as everything must be the totality of itself, is this totality, then, inevitable? And is this totality beauty? If such is the case, then beauty, archetypally, lies at the root of every existing thing which by existence has an identity. And every existing identity is a unit of beauty. Thus life, being, and beauty and the good come into a strange and wonderful identity. Plotinus, however, is not quite certain of this point either. Because Plotinus, while he identifies platonically and neoplatonically, beauty and the good, declares that while these, as far as man's consciousness is concerned, cannot be distinguished one from another that there is a priority in reality itself, and that actually the good is prior to the beautiful. Therefore, that the good may be considered to be the fountain of beauty. And the reason why the good is regarded as the fountain of beauty is that the good contains completely in itself and in abscondita the law which is beauty. In other words, Plotinus now advances the possibility that universal law emanating from the good and therefore of itself an eternal good 
flowing as from a father fountain, produces forever and continuously restatements of itself in the process of creation. Law is essential to good. It is the witness of that which is forever rightness. So we come to one of the great arguments of Aquinas, and we must finally conclude that a thing is because it is good. And therefore, that at the root of being, the creating power inevitably decrees the good. Now, the good moving into operation moves by laws conformity with it, in conformity with itself. And the motion of the good must always be the beautiful. Because the beautiful is now a dynamic. It is the firstborn of the good. Beauty, therefore, applied to the Christian concept of the Trinity would correspond to the second person. It is the Son. And as the Son bears witness to the Father, so beauty everywhere bears witness to good. Good, which is man's moral statement of oneness, or the eternal. And in this same course, by the analogy to the Trinity, beauty is also the Redeemer. For that which is created by law is perfected by beauty. And all motion in nature, according to law, is beautiful. And contrary to law, is not beautiful. In order to go further, we must go a little aside into other works of Plotinus to decide why something cannot be beautiful, or is not beautiful. Plotinus, following Plato and the other Greeks, declared that man, like Narcissus, gazing downward from a state of spiritual security, beheld form, body, its own reflection in a pool, fell in and drowned, trying to embrace its own shadow. Man descending into the obscuration of matter, taking upon himself form or body, is inwardly obscured and outwardly caused to hesitate. His inner impulses do not come through the body easily or rapidly. As you often hear the story of the musician with his famous trombone, he blew it in so sweet and it came out so sour. The individual lacking the ability to express or reveal the beauty within himself <coughs> makes partial and imperfect expression. Also, he is inwardly obscured in knowledge, in understanding, and in spirituality. Therefore, under the weight of this obscuration, he falls upon evil ways and evil times, and therefore is capable of action contrary to law, and thus brings himself under the retribution of law. So that asymmetry or deformity or lack of beauty is in some way the result of the obscuration of the natural motion of law and life. In this sense, then, to return to our other thinking, that which is not so beautiful may exist. And by the same explanation, man may describe as beautiful that which is only beautiful to him because of the obscuration of his own senses. And as each person has a different degree of this obscuration, there will inevitably be innumerable standards of acceptance and rejection on the level of beauty. That which is beautiful to the primitive human being is not satisfying to the highly sensitive human being. Thus beauty, however, has been identified as a motion, as a principle emanating from the father fountain of eternal good. And that this motion, therefore, is rhythm, is harmony, is law, and is order. All these things must then be present in the good. And here we come uh, to another important uh, step. 
having established in our own thinking, at least in part, some skeletal outline of the theory of Plotinus on the nature of the beautiful, we come early in his little writing to the question that most naturally arises. Why do we recognize beauty? How do we recognize beauty? And what makes us pause, change our mood, and become affected by the subtle symmetry of things? He says, because in each human being there is a soul. And following Plato and Pythagoras, he declares the soul, although he only mentions it in this essay, he goes much more in detail in, his other, in many of his other works. But uh, we'll have to occasionally borrow from the other essays, and we can't note each one as we pass, because it would take too much time and burden the discussion. But everything we are saying is derived from some writing of Plotinus. He explains that the soul of man, following Plato's concept, is a mathematical formula. Now this does not mean that it is merely a series of lines on some invisible sheet of paper. It is a living formula. It is an archetype. It is a magnificent geometric entirety, a unity, like some strange, perfectly formed snow crystal. The soul may therefore be mathematically defined, analyzed, and will be proved upon analysis to be of its own substance and nature, balanced and equal in all its parts, having no deformity or deficiency, and suffering from no privation of excellence in any of its qualities. This soul, then, is like the diamond soul of Tibetan Buddhism. It is a radiant manifestation of eternal law, a full realization or revelation of the power of the one flowing through the beautiful into the good. The soul is therefore unity. <coughs> and in man it is a superior unity, the most complete unity of which he is capable of personal and immediate experience. Now Plotinus implies that as the poet says, the eyes are the windows of the soul. But he also tells us that the ears may also bring messages, and that the hand may bring reactions from touch as to shapes and textures of things. And the Chinese go so far as to say that the tongue and the taste buds uh, can bring us the most spiritual uh, enjoyment, simply because all of these reflexes of pleasantness, of law and order, of propriety and symphony, even going into the preparation of a dish of Chinese food, all of these things are part of a pattern and a plan. Chinese believe a man digests his food better if the texture, the color, the flavor, the degree of temperature, and the size and shapes of the individual morsels are carefully considered. Thus, through these windows, these sensory perceptions, the soul gazing outward is forever fulfilling or seeking to fulfill its own expectancy. Let us say for a moment that you spend 20 years in the study of art, and as a result of all that very serious and conscientious endeavor, you become what might be termed sensitive to art, truly sensitive. Is it not then true that wherever you look in your daily wanderings, you will see art because you have trained yourself to see it. You have an appreciation of it. Furthermore, you will naturally decide that some things are more artistic than others. You will look at a landscape of beautiful trees against the sky, and you would say that would be perfect 
if one tree was not there. Something has broken the pattern. Therefore, if you paint that picture, you would leave that tree out to meet the aesthetic standard of your own appreciation. Going into an art gallery, you would with greater discrimination turn inevitably to better pictures. And you would say that the simple oriental artist who would explain nothing, describe nothing, would comment on nothing, but would stand in front of a picture and simply say, it pleases me. This was because it satisfied. If then we can train one small part of the soul through discipline to have this selectivity and to also to gain a new and unexpected pleasure from the observance of that which fulfills its own requirement, therefore nourishes it or sustains it or justifies its own inward conviction of itself, then, says Plotinus, we accept the beautiful because the soul in us, being in itself beautiful, rejoices in beholding its own likeness in other things. Always, therefore, that which brings to us the feeling of beauty and the joy and the thrill the great contentment of spirit that comes from the satisfaction given by the beautiful. All of this is merely a reflex from the soul telling us that it has found that which is like itself. In another essay, Plotinus explains in almost identical terms the meaning of love. For he says that love is that longing for completeness or for unity within the soul which is ever seeking to restore the fragments of its own nature and finds in the world someone who seems to bring more completeness to its own life. So beauty as experienced as, as giving pleasure was under the criticism of that great critique, the soul itself, that which determines proportion, that which accepts only according to its own pleasure. If this soul, therefore, is awake and has been strongly cultivated, it has a greater and nobler concept of beauty, but even in its most imperfect and deprived state some ray or fragment of it is still powerful enough to seek fulfillment. And the primitive artist finds fulfillment in the crude figure that he has carved. For him it is beautiful.